uh, I guess uh, now that we're all here, I'm going to introduce our uh, panel moderator. It's Dan Smith of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He's a longtime GSAW supporter and GSAW program committee member. Please welcome Dan Smith. In the past, we've had uh, fairly long introductions for each panel member, and they had introductory charts. We're really dispensing with that most of that this time, so we can really get down to some questions, and you'll get to know all the panelists from, from their viewpoints and, and how they answer things. But just as quick introductions, we have Dr. James Cutler, a lot of you know from the GSAW efforts for many years. Uh, started with Stanford, is where we knew him from here, and was very active in GSAW for quite a few years now at University of Michigan, doing a lot of CubeSat work, and we've heard him several times in the last day or two. Uh, Sarah Hobart, uh, I know her from NASA Ames on the LADI program, where she runs Ames's multi-mission control center and, and working with uh, the LADI mission ops effort there, which is really looking at doing more low-cost ops centers. Uh, her background, other than singing in the International Space Orchestra <laughs> and, and taking up recently the ukulele, <laughs> uh, she's been with NASA since 2006. Uh, she has a, a BA and an MBA from uh, UC Berkeley for the, for the MBA and graduate certificate in space systems engineering from Stevens Institute. So she, she kind of has the NASA perspective on a lot of these. We have Colonel Scott Beidelman in the middle. He is the Director for Development Planning Directorate in the Space and Missile Systems Center here at uh, LA Air Force Base. As such, he's very much involved in the planning of the future space and missile missions you know, across the entire center, but also looking at the planning processes for technology investments. And we'll hear a lot from that aspect because he's really the forward thinker for a lot of what's going on with SMNC. And that's great. His background, education-wise, goes back to a BS uh, from Penn State, and then a whole list of master's level programs and master of strategic studies from the U.S. Army War College and other, other awards and credentials along the way. Then we have Teresa Rhoda Jorgensen. We've already, you've already met her. <laughs> She has uh, enthusiasm for CubeSats. <laughs> and then Nestor Petya, again, Nestor's been involved with GSAW, comes over from Europe every year and uh, works on a planning committee, supports our, our working groups. But he has some very important roles. Uh, CCSDS chairman uh, for all the ground system standards activities of the International Data Standards Committee group. He also holds a chair. He's chair of the Engineering Steering Group, which kind of helps oversee all the CCSDS activities as well. But in addition, he plays an important role at ESA, where he heads the Data Systems Infrastructures Division's Ground Engineering Department at ESA, and is chair of the, what they call Technology Harmonization on Ground System Software. So he's re we're really working across ESA to say, how should they standardize their ground systems? Where do they push for the commonality and consistency and, and keeping their costs low? So those are five panelists. And what we'll do is I'll ask a series of questions, uh, both some that we've prepared in advance, kind of steer things through. As you have questions, again, pass them through the aisle, and we'll, we'll mix things up a little bit. Uh, we also have a series of questions that we will limit your time to answer to five seconds uh, to make sure that we're not having rambling answers for, for some of them. Not all questions need to be limited to five seconds. Okay, so certain questions, if, if there's something you really want to get across, this, please go beyond the five second rule. No, yes, no, maybe same as what they said. So, just as a way to kind of introduce the roles you have in your organizations, what I've seen in the last couple of days here at GSAW is, to me, all the cards are up in the air. On the technology side, we keep hearing about, you know, we've got the cloud activities going on, the virtualization, there's lots of things going on. 
on mission operations, we look at fleet operations, light out operations. Some groups don't have operators in their control centers anymore. You know, there's a lot going on there. CubeSats, we're only scratching the surface with that wing for ops. Then we have architecture changes coming in, the talk of frameworks, the role of the standards, how interoperable do we need to, to be to have things work efficiently. So we have all those going on. To me, I'm not sure where all the cards are going to come down, other than <coughs> what seems to be consistent is we still have the stovepipes. As many years as we say all the changes are coming, we see things a lot, a lot the same. So I guess looking at that breadth of where things could be changing, just kind of talk to where your group stands. Is, is one of those standing out as more the game changer right now? Or your main emphasis is down one of those directions more than others? And just give us a feel of, of where you're involved and what do you see as the, the major targeted areas for your group? Just start with Dr. Cup. It's uh, great to be here, so thanks again for, for the opportunity. Um, from sort of a, a flight build perspective, we build spacecraft end-to-end, -end, we build software for the ground systems end-to-end, -end. Uh, we use it for missions as well as for training, for education. My research emphasis is, um, one of the emphasis is on ground station systems. Uh, and we were inspired by a keynote talk um, a few years ago from a general here at GSAW, and he wanted to end communication as a constraint. Uh, so that's sort of a, a phrase that we sort of hold on to often, how can we end communication as a constraint? And um, one of the things we're trying to do, we're focusing on, is uh, interoperation and then multi multidisciplinary design optimization. So how do we get all these sort of disparate nodes to coordinate and communicate with each other? The internet is a fantastic example of that. We have a variety of different devices. We communicate inherently on the internet quite easily. Why is it so difficult in space? So how do we interoperate? Um, and then how do we sort of optimize across this heterogeneous system? So those are the sort of the two main research tests that we're working on right now. Hi, I'm uh, really excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. This is my first GSOM. So I've really been listening to the themes that emerge over the, the last few days. So I've heard a lot about reusability, reconfigurability, resilience of systems. And what I hear is that these are all different ways of saying, how do you deal with scarce resources? And that's, that's something we do a lot at NASA. That's something we do a lot at Ames. and something that I'm particularly interested in. So one of the ways to deal with that is to consciously maintain choices that give us the greatest flexibility in the future. You don't know what's coming down the pike. So you have to think about that and how do you maintain that flexibility. Has anybody seen the Lego movie? Anybody? Yes, good. Everything is awesome, yes. Um, <laughs> CubeSats especially. So I saw the Lego movie just before I came to the conference. So I've been thinking about Legos as I've also been thinking about ground systems. And uh, probably none of you know that it was invented by a Danish carpenter. And he first built wooden toys. And his first toy was a wooden duck, which you've never heard of. And then he, in uh, 1947, bought this injection molding machine and had this great idea to have a building toy. Well, the first attempts were, you know, great. They're little plastic bricks. You can stack them up. You can build things. The problem is you can knock them over really easily, too. So what do you do? You glue them together. Now you've built something. Yeah, don't glue them together. <laughs> <laughs> Especially not because they're Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. But now you built something and you're stuck, you're locked in. I, I'm sure everybody in this audience has had that experience of being locked into a particular piece of hardware, a particular piece of software, it's glued, you can't take it apart. So for the next 11 years, his son worked on various systems of making these little bricks into a lock. And finally in 1958, they came up with it. It's a very nice, satisfying, it snaps together. If you build it, it stays put. But the genius is, if you take it apart, you can build something else. You don't have to throw those bricks away. So that's, that's what I've been thinking about as I've been going through this conference, that you know, we, we need to spend as much time thinking about the connectors as about the capabilities of the components that we're connecting. And I've seen a lot of that with people thinking about the, uh, you know, the standards, the frameworks, um, the cloud. CubeSats. CubeSats are the ultimate Legos in space, really, if you think about it. So I, I see that as a, as a theme. If, if you could find a vintage Lego from 1958, you could take that, you could go down to the toy store today, 2014, 
and you could use it to build something. I mean, how cool is that? So that's, that's the paradigm I want to be thinking about. Um, and crown systems are hard. They're not little plastic bricks, obviously. But the idea of thinking about the connector, spending at least as much time and attention on that as you do on the capabilities of human beings. There we go. Hi, um, I'm also excited to be here. Uh, with the government travel restrictions, I don't get out much these days. <laughs> so uh, anytime I get a chance to talk about uh, XR, Development Planning Directorate, and our mission uh, in any farm really is, is, uh, is a plus. It's a great day for me. So uh, real, real brief, our, our mission uh, within the SMC uh, in the Development Planning Directorate, deliver affordable and resilient solutions for future military space capability. So we do this by uh, developing ideas, concepts, and architectures to mitigate capability needs identified by our hiring orders. Uh, we also manage technology to make sure that those ideas are actually feasible. And uh, then we prove out those concepts through the execution of demonstrations. And we do this across all different mission areas, and, and that way we incubate new capability. And I was thinking, you know, we don't really, we don't really treat, we as an SMC, I guess, uh, think about uh, uh, ground systems as their own mission area. Traditionally, every system has its own ground system, right? And there, by definition, you end up with these proprietary capabilities. Stovepipe, I think, is the buzzword we throw around. And so, uh, but our, my job is to come up with new and better ways to do things to reduce costs and uh, to increase resiliency, right? So um, there are a couple of areas that we're focusing on. We, we don't necessarily move out and say, all right, we're going to uh, we're going to improve ground systems across the board. But um, we have a couple of areas. I'll lump them in some categories here. Uh, open architectures. We talked about, I, I just briefly talked about stovepipes and how we're kind of almost organized to think that way to begin with. So we have some studies that are going on, some other capabilities and projects uh, in an effort to get away from having uh, you know, GPS with its own system, uh, Millstar and <coughs> Chef and so on, and all these other acronyms I'm throwing out here, they're different spacecraft, right? Uh, have, they all have their own ground systems. Um, we don't need to do it that way. In fact, as we'll probably get through in some of the questions, we really can't afford to do it that way in the future. Also, increased autonomous operations. Uh, when I was uh, a second lieutenant 25 years ago, I came out to uh, Colorado and I flew the GPS constellation with a lot of other people sitting around on the crew. It's still kind of done that way, uh, but I recently visited Iridium and Intelsat, a couple of other places that fly lots of spacecraft with very few people. Um, we can do better on that, and quite frankly, with the number of reductions in personnel that we're dealing with over the next few years, we kind of have to. Uh, and then, of course, uh, two other areas, increased asset sharing, uh, again, in, a, in an area of, of, of budget cuts, uh, anybody out there who has ground capability, we have to figure out ways to utilize that, whether they be other government agencies, uh, other uh, allied partners, or uh, even commercial uh, assets. And that's the last part, increased um, use, or at least examine the, the ability to move capacity, government capacity, onto commercial assets. So that's kind of the areas that we're trying to move uh, SMC into those, those different directions, uh, or at least examining the, the, the feasibility of going in those areas. Yes, I think you have heard all about what, what I do, what I think. But one thing I just want to add to this is whenever I have a decision to make on some investment to do, and it's in particular, not just an individual uh, CubeSat project, that, that's kind of easy. The, you look through the proposal, you review it, you see whether it's an excellent idea or not, what the capabilities are, have they, have they set up a good plan for how to carry it through, and then you make your decision. But uh, invariably comes decisions of more infrastructure-like uh, questions. And, and the difficult thing I always have is, how, do I invest in this? And, and how do I still keep it open to innovation? How do I keep it open to all these new players that want to participate? How do I make it not so prescriptive that, that now we're sort of set in this glued down legal track? So, so I, I associate very much with that. Uh, so, as a representative, so to speak, uh, together with Jamie for, for this, these uh, new players in space, uh, how, how do we protect the openness of that? We, we, we need these new players. We need the influx of idea and innovation they bring. So make it, make it open and flexible enough for everybody. So I will start my uh, speech now 
from an example, and we, I will not talk about technical things. Uh, my son works in the same organization that I am working. He's 33 years old, very innovative, and he calls me Mr. Flintstone. <laughs> <laughs> Why is this? Because uh, he believes that I am in the Stone Age. And this is one of the biggest problems of the high-level managers in our organization that are risk-averse and don't like to change technology very fast. And the game changers are asking for that, and this is the problem that we are facing. My guys came seven years ago with cloud, with virtualization. When they mentioned the cloud, I looked to the sky <laughs> hmm, to see what, has, what was happening. Uh, today we are deploying operational these concepts seven years to, to have this. And this is our biggest problem when universities are coming now and saying, I can build a CubeSat and launch in one year. And we say, fantastic, but uh, we cannot do it or we have a lot of problems. The manager from the resources point of view, full accountability and risk aversion. And this is the biggest problem. It's not a technology, a technical problem, it's a cultural problem. Okay. Yeah. I know our theme is looking to the future. I'm just curious, what's your group's oldest piece of technology curr currently still in use to support your missions? Uh, just our infrastructure that is used for everything has been designed in the beginning of the 80s, we are still in Corva, hmm? all the systems, C++, and the problem that new university guys don't have the experience on that. Eh? We are not saying COBOL, but uh, <laughs> we are close. And, and this is one of the, the biggest problems with these oldest technologies, and we still need to support. And, uh, it's uh, easy to say, let's change it, but the, the time that you need, we measure in decades, not in years. To deploy a new infrastructure operational, since you, say, you take the decision, it takes 10 years. Our common core, that is uh, our biggest initiative in Europe in the last 30 years, has started in 2009, Next week, we have, we did the deliver the PDR package. Mm? Just to give you an idea, and it's only paper. Mm? There is nothing behind. Only paper, 2,000 pages of design, but we started in 2009. So we are speaking about five years, and then we need five years to implement and integrate. These are 10 years. If you tell this to the university guys, they will say, you are crazy, go on pension. <laughs> Sarah, you have any? Uh, Anybody else comments on, on I, old systems? I was just going to say NASA Ames is the oldest NASA center, so we're pretty. Uh, I, I wouldn't know how to choose, actually. I think the HVAC in the uh, flight dynamics room. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, me? I'm the oldest <laughs> in our group. There you go. <laughs> I mentioned taking a taxi and they looked at me like, a taxi? What is that? <laughs> Uber X or something? Have you guys heard of that? Anyway. Um, uh, the uh, Apollo 13, you know the movie where the air filter fails and the engineer walks out and dumps all the stuff on the table and they have to make this square thing look like this round thing. Um, that's one of the things that at least the students I work with are really good at. We take old pieces and we take new pieces and try to fit them all together. And this is very much like a Lego brick thing. Um, so we just inherited a dish from the 60s, the 50s, right? And we're trying to figure out what those big top knob knobs are. And actually, students, this is a vacuum tube. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the real trick is is uh, leveraging. I mean, we buy all of our equipment off of eBay, right? So the the, the 1980s spectrum analyzer is fantastic and it's cheap. You have to smack it to get it to work, right? Um, but it works. I, I, uh, I would uh, reiterate that, yes, sometimes I feel like I'm the oldest thing that we have, and you're giving all the, uh, the young folks coming in the organization. But, but that, there is so much old stuff in the government, uh, it's hard to really pinpoint it. You know, we have some processors on board, some spacecraft that are something like the, uh, the 386, I believe, uh, in, in, in 
way, way back in the, the, the mid-80s or so on. And then we have some requirements that are out there that have been around a very long time that we are still designing spacecrafts to. So, uh, so perhaps a whole uh, hodgepodge of requirements and some of the, and I think our, our, our boss, Joe Shelton, once joked that some of our spacecraft are uh, old enough to vote. <laughs> and, and recently, maybe even old enough to drink. <laughs> okay, next, there are lots of initiatives going on with, between each of these organizations. Can you comment on where you're going outside your organization, <laughs> either collaborations or sharing ideas with others? Because uh, again, we can't just keep studying and replicating inside each of our organizations. So any Jamie, I know with you, you formed a whole community now, which is a very different way to work. Yeah, so I mean, when you have nothing, you have to share, right? So that's sort of where the QTEs were born from. We, we didn't have anything. Uh, and once money showed up, actually, we started to peek a little bit on, on what we share and what we go after. Um, but we all need ground station systems. You build a spacecraft, and the more ground station systems, the more ground support you have, the better your mission will be. So it's a natural, uh, a natural place to, to share. Um, frankly, I think that there is a competitive environment within the aerospace industry, which is really hard to navigate, um, especially from a university perspective. I mean, I compete against primes in, in building spacecraft for people, and that's just not the way it should be. Um, I see interactions between agencies, between centers from different agencies, and I'm like, you guys have the resources to solve this problem, but you're fighting. That's just ridiculous. Why are you doing that? Um, so it's really beneficial to see people from top sort of step down and say, stop this, this is what you're going to do. Um, and it helps sort of clearly define those roles. I mean, that's what I think is exciting about what I see from NSF, is you guys give us just enough money to make it feasible, not enough to make it easy, all right? So that means we have to innovate, <clears throat> and then the money's provided, and then you sort of step out of the way, and we do get out to get it done. Um, and uh, you, you, you provide that money. So when we take the idea to you, we know that if the idea is good, it's going to happen. Uh, the idea won't be uh, absorbed and then taken and then implemented by somebody else. In the European Space Agency, by principle, we have collaboration with all the national agencies, and but we are giving and sharing the Flintstone car between us. We have international collaboration mainly with the US, JPL, Goddard, Ames, but um, it's very difficult uh, to uh, compare technologies. I believe from my personal point of view that the technology push in the States is uh, faster than the technology push in Europe. Europe is too conservative and uh, <coughs> costs a lot to uh, infuse new things in, in the programs. Now we are having uh, non-warranty service missions, but uh, you fight with the European scientists as well. They don't want to lose one bit of data. And we are saying if you allow 90% of science data return, we can eliminate the redundancy uh, chain everywhere. And this uh, has a lot of savings. But we are facing this problem that the scientist wants the data, more data, and uh, this has a cost associated. And new technologies need to be verified every time that we not, uh, uh, want to deploy something comes. The security officer, is secure this? The redundancy master of the universe, is, how is the redundancy? Is this certified? Do you have platinum support 24? Uh, per seven, and our guys, our young uh, young guys in my division are saying, I can go to in in Europe is very famous MediaMark because it's like uh, I believe Aldi has been deployed here or like Ike Ikea, uh, that where you can buy for 300 euros equipment that is the same with the same characteristics that we are deploying. We are paying 5,000 euros because it's certified, it has support and so on convinced to go to bridge that barrier is very difficult because you are attempting as well to the terms of reference of these people or if these people is essential or not in the organization. And there is a, a lot of uh, terms of reference what we need to do and you cannot fight against that. And this goes against as well the technology deployment. I'm gonna go way off on a tangent, sort of, but Ground systems 
are an immense way to collaborate internationally. Okay, um, our best downloaders are Japanese and the German. Okay, uh, technologically, I would argue that the CubeSats, until probably the last two years, have been led by Europe. If I wanted to buy an off-the-shelf spacecraft, the best parts would not have come from the U.S. They would have come from someplace else. Um, and if you take a look at Denmark, I mean, you guys, uh, Alberg, right, Gone Space, um, you guys are, you guys jumped right on board initially to sort of drive this. ISIS, um, you guys have really been doing it. Um, so from a educational, global perspective, there's a really interesting way to kind of partner, build relationships with this. I get emails from places I shouldn't get emails from. And I'm really tempted to say, yes, I would love to see your ground station in Baghdad. Um, let's download some data, okay? And from a, an NSF space weather perspective, I think that would be a really tangible, I'm not gonna go there anytime soon, uh, but that would be fantastic. Um, I get emails from Yemen, not Yemen, Sudan, um, other locations, uh, Africa, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. Um, it's a really nice global way to kind of unite some of this stuff. And from an altruistic <coughs> or international kind of perspective, I think there's a lot of opportunity that we can tap. I hope they're not going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for, for my organization, we don't have our own budget. So, we, the, we live and die with the success of our collaborative efforts. And uh, if you were in some of the workshops, or one of the workshops this week, uh, we have a CubeSat uh, constellation on our called SENSE. So that's a great example of both collaboration, both internal to SMC, because all of that was paid for by somebody else, and uh, you know, the, the uh, intellectual support as well came from a number of different organizations. So uh, the ground system was paid for by one organization, the actual spacecraft was paid for by another organization, and my organization sort of just sort of ran as the integrator for that and the operator. Uh, but on the ground system side, we have an agreement, an MOA memorandum of uh, agreement with uh, the Naval Research Laboratory, to actually share their ground assets. They have a facility at uh, Blossom Point, Maryland, and we have a facility at Curtin Air Force Base. So we have uh, an agreement where they can schedule contacts on our uh, ground systems, and we can do the same. And it's worked out really, really well. We, uh, from our SENSE perspective, our, our, our SENSE program, we've never missed us a, a, a contact using their, uh, their equipment uh, because of a resource uh, availability issue. Okay. I think you can go even further with that analogy too, um, particularly with the Aerospace Corporation. Uh, I think they've been really helpful in the technology demos that they've been doing. And um, CubeSats came from a mission called Opal, and Opal deployed these little daughter ships called Pico Satellites. And two of the Pico Satellites came were funded by DARPA and were built by the Aerospace Corporation. And so they've got this internal program, uh, which is fantastic to interface with. Because you ask them the question, they're like, all right, our solar panels had an issue, go talk to this expert, because they now have a, uh, they have a technique for doing non-destructive testing what's going on, and they were instrumental in helping out some of the sense spacecraft get past the, uh, the Biden environment. So that's been very good for people to see. Uh, fairly quick, but more than five seconds. <laughs> As we look at cloud technologies, we've heard an awful lot about that. There are also concerns about using the cloud. Where do you see that headed, and is your group actively pursuing different cloud technologies now? Yes. So we have just deployed our cloud uh, services in the European Space Agency. The biggest problem was not technological, <coughs> was trustability. Because the people was starting to say, uh, who is giving these services? Who is the owner of this company? If I deploy this, my data that is confidential in, in that servers, Will we get there or will be taken out by some other strange uh, retrievals? So, which was the conclusion? The service is done, will be done by a company in Switzerland, and we hope that they keep the confidentiality as they keep the bank account of the world citizens. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this was the main, main discussion point is trustability. After all these problems with NSA and so on in the world, uh, this is uh, something that is sticking in the, in the head of every manager. Uh, where do I put my data? Is uh, safe. Uh, will be retrieved by any other means. And this is why uh, now we are using a cloud that normally is private in, the, in different ESA sites, that you can use for other type of data, 
remotely in Switzerland, the, the cloud the infrastructure or virtualize, and, and you pay a service that costs much more than Amazon service, because Amazon came to us saying, oh, we have for you the European uh, cloud. We say, thank you very much. <laughs> So I think that's that's a really important point. The that the technological issues aren't the big thing for the cloud. Those are those you can overcome. But the idea of trust and how do you build up that trust? And people are much more comfortable. Managers, at least, are much more comfortable with they have their you know their system and they can go and reboot it or unplug it or whatever they need to do. And so when something's in the cloud, especially if they don't understand what that means. Uh, that's that's not a very comfortable position for them. And if the cloud provider can't tell you immediately what's where, then uh, that trust is going to be very hard to establish. So I, I think that uh, cloud is going to sort of come in through the back door, actually. It's not going to be a top-down thing in most organizations. It's going to be people will get, well, people are getting more comfortable with virtualization. They see the benefit of that. And they realize that, well, this is fine. They, you know, I don't really have to be that concerned about it. And you know, once you have virtualization, then you start getting the other aspects of cloud. The, uh, the Goddard Science Operations Center, Paul Swenson gave the presentation on it yesterday. That's definitely moving towards cloud. So that's, I think the trust will come. It will build gradually. And it, it's, it's coming. From, uh military SMC government perspective, I'd say uh, uh, yes, slowly, cautiously. Mm -hmm. um, information assurance, uh, you know, cyber security, and all that. Um, so we have done a couple of low-end projects with this, though. We, we had a joint capability technology demonstration a few years ago uh, where we downloaded uh, RadarSat data and we distributed it through a cloud uh, configuration uh, because there's just quite a few users that wanted to see that and they needed uh, almost near real time uh, uh, low latency basically. Uh, and when you look at what we, we need to do in the Department of Defense, we have a lot of users on the ground across all the services. So really cloud computing is something we're going to have to get to uh, in order to get that data to everybody who needs it as fast as possible. I really don't see really how, how we can get around it, but again, uh, really slow and cautious. We're having a lot of fun with the cloud. Um, <laughs> about a month ago, though, Gmail went down, and all of us just stood up and said, oh my god, what do we do? Gmail down, we can't access any of our emails, our to-do lists are gone. Um, so we, massive internet connectivity is, uh, networking connectivity is, is, is where we need to be and how we're moving stuff around. Uh, one analogy I like to play with, though, is, is I have an iPhone, uh, because it does what I want it to do perfectly well, and I'm happy with it. Uh, if I was a grad student, I wouldn't have the iPhone, I'd have the Android, because uh, I would hack it, and I would have the time and the freedom to make it do crazy things. So as we take a look at the cloud, we're looking at sort of the iPhone features where you know that they're, they're optimized for what you want to do. At the same time, we want the lower level hackability of an Android, where we can make it do new things that have never been done before. Okay. Over the last several decades, the whole industry is built up. We have COTS vendors, integration vendors, the large, you know, the big companies, all supported by the aerospace industry. As we move towards CubeSats, what do you see as the changing role for COTS products and for, quote, the big boys? And are we, what do we do to redefine the industry, or is that, are we going to have two parallel universes continuing? Any thoughts on how the, the bigger picture setup is going to be changing? I'm going to refer back to uh, the slide with the, the horse that Gert presented yesterday. So there's the, the technology horse, the race horse, and there's the, you know, the little wooden horse or duck. Um, and I, I think that they're, they're not going to be parallel universes. They're going to be pulling each other along. So at, at one point, uh, you know, maybe CubeSats are going to figuratively strap rockets on that wooden horse, and it's going to zoom ahead. And, and then the, uh, the bigger vendors will come in and say, okay, we, we see how you did that. We're going to do that even better, and we're going to scale it in ways that you could never even imagine. I believe if the COTS uh, vendors are clever enough, can have a flexible system that can support a big satellite and a CubeSat with the same type of functionality, 
and for the cubes as running in a box as well. Th this is possible. The functionality to monitor and control the CubeSat or a big satellite from the housekeeping point of view is very similar. So I don't believe it's a, a barrier there, but the, the COTS vendor or the providers of ground system software needs to be flexible and, and develop a flexible system that allows to monitor both or the constellation because CubeSat will come as constellation as well. So you will have the same problems of multi-mission and control from a position controlling seven, eight, ten satellites, the, pro the functionality will be very similar for both. I think the CubeSat's really introducing a problem with the cost model in sort of the aerospace industry as well, too. Uh, for better or worse, a lot of the CubeSat builders think they can build anything. And in many ways, they've proven that they can. Um, but we also know it's hard. So when we take a look at buying large numbers of things, if it's more than 80K or 100K, we're going to do it ourselves, because that's one person's year of time. We can pull it off and do it ourselves. So it's really changing how the COTS market needs to address and finance uh, their particular things. Um, if there's any authors in the crowds, um, I would really recommend taking a look at Planet Labs and Skybox and watching this clash of classic aerospace meet CubeSat, meet new industry, meet internet. Um, <clears throat> Skybox started and it looked a lot like Planet Labs. Um, then they made a lot of acquisitions and new hires, and now they're changing into sort of more of a traditional aerospace company. How is that changing? How is that evolving? Will Planet Labs go on that same route? And uh, I think we'll have some pretty interesting questions and analysis from them. Um, I would say that uh, whoever meets our requirements at the best price, whether they're big guys or little guys, those are the folks that we're going to go with. And uh, if they do that by using COTS products, uh, so be it. Um, it just so happens uh, for our source selection for our, our small, our endeavor into CubeSats, as we see in the Sense program, uh, a larger company ended up getting the contract. Um, it'll come down to that. And that was, a, that was a very long and difficult source selection because there were a lot of players there. Uh, but ultimately, in the end, uh, the government believed that uh, that particular company was the best one for it. So it'll come down to whoever gives us the best uh, uh, set of uh, meeting our requirements for the best price. But I also would add, I I'm, don't have a lot of expertise in that, but, but seen from the outside that the future's big satellites are simply a constellation of smaller ones. So, if, I mean, that also blows the cost market potential. Okay, so yeah, I agree with you. And, uh, not that big satellites will completely go away, but the idea of being able to la launch not just constellations, but self-organizing constellations that can, again, getting back to the Lego analogy, they can reorganize themselves to do different things. They, you know, you can have, um, they just, so at Ames we're, we're working on some, uh, some technology demonstrations to do constellations of satellites that talk to each other. Uh, there's a lollipop configuration, what we call lollipop, which is there, you know, a lot of little satellites up there, and there's one person who's sort of like Capcom. It's like you're the you're the satellite that talks to the ground. If that one gets knocked out, you can reprogram it, and one of the other ones can come in and say, "Oh, okay, I'm Capcom now, and now I talk to the ground." We've talked a lot about uh, the forcing function of costs. Reduced costs makes us innovate. But let's, let's talk about other things that are leading to the innovation. So there's been some questions. If we're very constrained on communications and infrastructure, is that really also a forcing function? Or is that something that we complain about and wish there was more? And I guess, where, where do you see all the incentives for different innovation coming from right now? Other than you know, the cost, which is the one we keep hearing about. I'd say the answer to your question is it you know is it a constraining function and is it something that drives innovation and is it something that we complain about the answer of course is yes we're always going to complain about lack of resources um, but yeah as James said if you don't have much you have to share so that's going to be a driving function and that will drive down costs so multi-mission operation centers are a great example of that CubeSats are another great example um, going to eBay to buy parts which I can't do uh, is another example. I will respond with a joke that is floating in ESA since several years about costs. 
So ground station cost, the formula is one million euro per meter of antenna. So if you have a deep speed space antenna, 35 meters cost the whole ground station, 35 million euros. If you have a two meters antenna, you pay two million euros. On the ground segment, for any mission, if it's a small ground segment, 10 million, medium, 20, big, 40. You can do all the things, a business case, when you look at the prices in the last 15 years, it's more or less there. And this, what, what happens? The whole cost, not many of the ground station, that is a lot of hardware, on the ground segments is manpower driven. 66% of our ground segment cost is manpower and 20 is um, recharges. So the 15% of the cost is the real work of the industry developing the system and so on. All the other things is manpower. And uh, this has as well certain e effects on the workforce management and so on. So and this is why you cannot reduce the cost uh, a lot if you are a civil servant organization. And uh, this is one of our uh, main uh, pro not problems, issues to solve in the future. I think the aerospace industry as a whole is anti-innovation. And I'm just going to flat out say that. Um, take a look at the requirements document, right? You start off anti-innovation with, we start off by having requirements. We put those constraints on and we've got to fit the box for puns. It's a culture of descope, right? You go to the PDR and here's one of the things I'm going to kick off. Um, and so when we teach that at the university, we teach the SMAD space solution analysis and design process. We teach all of that. Um, the waterfall versus the, the sort of the cyclic nature, all the requirements, derivations, and things like that. But at the same time, when we build our spacecraft, I'm like, your job is to put as much as you can inside that box, all right? Um, the scientists want a gigabyte of data. You have a 10 kilobit per second link. Figure out how to get them more data. Um, so instead of a requirements-based uh, effort, what we're doing is changing those requirements into constraints. They're still requirements. We just call them constraints. And then we come up with an objective function. That we then try to optimize. All right, so we meet the minimum requirement for the data we need to bring down, but then let's push it. Right? Can we get down two, three times more amounts of data? Um, and that's what I'm challenging with our students: is what can you put in that box um, so that when you get out to industry and you suddenly have a kilowatt of power, imagine what you can do with that. <laughs> so I, I'm going to mess with your piece of joke because uh, the technology demonstration that was on Laddie that was very, very successful was laser comb from the moon. So talking about bandwidth and, and data, and you, you're not talking about you know small amounts of data anymore. Now this is from lunar distance. You can get much better from LEO, but lunar distance, we demonstrated over 622 megabits per second. So that's, that's pretty decent. And that also goes towards the, the staffing because what, now we just played around with it because we, we used RF for the, for the standard mission because this was a technology demonstration and we had science that we were doing as well. But you know, you could stream videos. We were sending up photos and you know, bring downlinking photos and you know, we could download the whole flight software and lo reload the whole flight software in a fraction of the time that it usually takes. And if you think about the implications for staffing, for that, I mean, a lot of the staffing is people that are sitting around and watching telemetry sort of slowly crawl down to the ground. Um, so if you can get that housekeeping data, the science data, and it's like that, then you don't need as much staffing. You can do much more automation. There, there, if I remember the question, it was uh, the uh, things that are pushing innovation, right? And budget, everybody talks about. Well, um, our mission statement, two words in there, uh, kind of tell you the, uh, the reasons we, we need to innovate. One of them is affordable, right? That's the budget. The other one is resiliency, and that's because of the threat. So the other uh, huge uh, push for us to think outside the box, come up with uh, more interesting and, and uh, other alternatives, is the threat that we face for our, not only our, our assets in general, but really our on-orbit assets, which for the last 50 or so odd years really haven't really faced uh, any, any real real threat until, say, like the last 10 or so years. 
the threat has really, really changed over the last, just the last decade. Uh, with um, some of the adversaries out there having capabilities to reach us uh, pretty quickly uh, with very little warning time. So that makes you think about doing a lot of things differently. And so ideas about disaggregated architecture are starting to you know, become popular. Uh, the ideas of hosted payloads, uh, the ideas of smaller sets, more numerous smaller spacecraft, even down to the CubeSat, NanoSat, MicroSat size. So uh, so really for us, it's, it's almost, the budget is that huge, um, 800 pound gorilla in any room you go to with respect to government conversations, but right behind it, it is the, uh, the threat to our own urban assets. Sorry to come back from the coast, but uh, one of the biggest problems that I have as manager is that I need to cover my staff in the next five, six years. So every new project in the future that is asking me, uh, Nestor, I would like, yes, please give me manpower. Because I know that in the next five or in the fifth or in the fourth e year, I am getting down with the resources that I am getting. And this increased the cost of the project. And everybody's doing this. I don't know if in the States, but in, in, in our organization, you need to cover your staff. And the projects is one of the biggest source of manpower. And this increased the cost. And this is uh, the manpower driven factor that. Uh, when I am doing that, I am protecting my own unit. I am not looking how healthy will be the project from the cost point of view. I need to cover my staff. And you cannot get rid of your staff. This is not commercial. When you are in an intergovernmental civil servant, you cannot get rid of your staff. So you need to give them something to do. And if they get that, they charge a project and the cost goes up. So, and this is something that we are fighting uh, every day. In, when somebody comes on innovation, as, and I see that in three years I don't have enough manpower to cover my staff, innovation in Mr. Flintstone's pocket, you know where it's going. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely agree with you, and I, I know that uh, that issue very, very well. Um, what I would like to see, and I'm not saying that I'm seeing it, and the innovation issue is, is the other half of that point is, instead of having a lot of staff doing very simple things, have a lot of staff doing a lot of really interesting, cool stuff. So the, you know, instead of flying one big satellite, fly lots of small satellites, or fly lots of big satellites, because you have the technology to share the, uh, the mission operation center, the science operation centers to you know increase the bandwidth so that people don't have to sit there and, and, and babysit that particular satellite for very long. They can switch over to this other one. Being a new person in the space business myself, uh, what, what I saw happening uh, many times is that simply allowing new people in pushes innovation. And I, I know it's kind of almost obvious because we're dealing with universities and also I mean, they have the, they don't have the manpower issue in, in that direct way because the students are there for a while and then they go out and get jobs. Uh, and it's not that innovation can only come from universities, but but opening up, those, opening up to new players and having a bigger influx of players also push innovation and ideas. This is a quick comment. One of the, the phrases that we like to play around with too, I uh, learned it from Jim Newman, who's a former astronaut. He's at Naval Postgraduate School doing some fantastic stuff. He talks about the weight of experience. And uh, my favorite example is a picture of Anusha Ansari, uh, who funded the first X Prize uh, and was one of the first um, uh, citizen astronauts that went up on uh, the Russian launch program. She's got a picture of her with earmuffs on and a shotgun. And she's getting shotgun training. And that's because the Russian modules have a sawed off shotgun underneath the seat. Um, those are these capsules so that when they land in the mountains and the wolves come to get them, they've got a shotgun to shoot them. All right? So <laughs> there's a weight of experience that as we're striving for innovation, there's all these flight rules that have been built up over generations. And it's important to understand those and those sources and where they came from. And so when we bring our new students in, I often don't give them the flight rules because sometimes they find a way around them or they find a better way. But then as they start to blow stuff up, as they start to make mistakes, I'm like, here's the flight rule that fixes that. Now I'm going to do it. So you want the innovation, but you want that source, that weight of experience to kind of guide and, and avoid some of the mind possible. Okay, some of these questions are almost softballs, so you can hit them real easily. 
on even our smaller programs, at least on the government side, we get uh, software process improvement police, the equipment auditors that come through every month to make sure the PC is still on the same desk that it was before. The CMMI, are you at, you know, CMMI level two or three auditors that come through. The software quality assurance people. The, are you sure you did your time card right? You know, that should have been charged to testing police. The security folks, the security auditors, the security scanners, the security policy people, the security report writers. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, and those are costs to the program. They're, I'll use the word legitimate costs, meaning they are valid costs. And yet, we're trying to do things in a hurry. We're trying to do things cheap. What do you see is, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Where do we go with that? How do we keep these other stakeholders that from their mission perspective are playing an important role? And there is a root cause for why they're, they're after what they're after. But how does that collide and, and what do we do about that versus the, the very rapid cycle that we're all trying to deal with? So uh, I thought you said that was an easy. <laughs> well, I, I assume here from Keepsats we say we just don't have any of those guys. Next. No, unfortunately, uh, yeah, I got to worry about all that stuff. Um, but you know, um, our organization has pioneered at SMC a number of different items. Of course, the Keepsats was one of the, the first ones we, we really have done. But the hosted payload effort we did a couple of years ago, uh, Chirp, commercially hosted infrared payload. Uh, you'd have thought we brought in some kind of, you know alien creature from, from Area 51 when we first started talking about how how we were going to get this uh, into this into the basic, uh, you, you take this new idea and you bring it to this established method of doing business at SMC. It takes education, right? You have to sit down with all these folks who are doing their job, whether it be security or uh, uh, IA or whatever, and you, you tell them this is what we're doing and this is, you do your best to, to translate what it is you're doing and how you are, are meeting the intent of what they need to uh, audit, uh, but, but educating them that we're doing things a little bit differently. And they, in turn, at least at SMC, they, in turn, ended up modifying the instructions that drove how they did business. They realized that this is something different. It's not going away. We can't take the square hole in the round peg or whatever. You know, we, we, have to, we have to adapt. And we were reasonably successful, at, at, but it takes face-to-face, -face, sit down, and, and talk to them about it. It's education. For personally, for me, the security officers and the auditors, <coughs> internal and external, for for us sometimes are worse than your uh, mother-in-law visiting your wife <laughs> two or three weeks at home. And uh, one thing that we are always saying is. Please, if you have a system that is a piece of dot, 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 wrap it very nicely and demonstrate that you have wrapped following the process and the methodology and you have used a very uh, good quality paper and you will pass the audit. Because they are interested in process and methodology and not in the quality of the software. <laughs> One who says it goes together with this, if you, especially for the CubeSat world, if you, you need to buy into the whole paradigm. And part of these uh, uh, processes are in the risk. It's in the risk uh, attitude and the risk management. So if you accept the risk, you can do away. Uh, it's not that we just blindly do away with things, but we give it a very critical look at what is really necessary and what are we going to just live with. This is something that we even face in the university world. Um, I just got an email yesterday from the property guy, and there's a random audit on where particular assets are at, and they want to tag the Rex One spacecraft. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I can't go get it. I want it back so we can fix it. <laughs> yeah. You know, but then we have things like um, we deliver some hardware for um, uh, a low cost interplanetary and the process of when that hardware shows up at this institution requires the brakes to be checked on the vehicle that's going to move this piece of hardware from point A to point B. So that car has to have their brakes checked 
I'm like, do you realize how many cars it actually took to get it? I mean, my car that I drove, I mean, so there used to be flexibility in those rules. Um, I mean, you can see where that tracks down. The Galileo with this deployed antenna failure because it drove too much across the country. You see where these things come from. But are they, are they rigid or are they guidelines and work with really flexible in that? Um, so we have, one of the things that we try to do with, with my students is they're, they're kind of good at everything and maybe they'll specialize in one thing and be awesome at it. Um, but get the security right up front in their mentality to see what's happening. Let them build and see the need for quality control. Um, they have a taste of everything, so when that person does show up, they at least understand where it's coming from and can communicate with them to say, yes, we need this, no, we don't, please go away. Okay, the next one has to do with, with standards. We saw CubeSats just by packaging and several other very simple, you know, relatively simple things made revolutionary changes in, in efficiency. Is it practical that we can move towards additional standards by the spacecraft providers to simplify the job of the ground systems and operations and move towards increased consistency of how we interoperate with our spacecraft in order to help the, the ops side of things? And here I think Europe is way ahead of the US. Uh, yes, in some way, but uh, as you mentioned, as chair of the steering group of the CCSDS, we have the problem that the spacecraft manufacturers are not working with us for the space standards. And all the agencies are collaborating, but we don't have control of the standardized, which is our dream. That as you can download today in an iPhone an app, that you could do this with a mission control system, but you can do as well as this app on board. And then you have similar functionality. If you have a clever spacecraft that needs to do monitoring and control because there is no contact, the monitoring and control functions that are embedded there are very similar to the ones that you are exercising on ground. We, we saw yesterday with Gerd presented this OPSAT idea is going in that direction, but to infuse that in big satellites, well, I don't know if I, I will be in horizontal position probably. Mm -hmm. in the cemetery, because I will not see this in the next 20 or 30 years if I, I have good health, yeah? because Chase, you know. is, is it practical to, to change and get consistency between flight and ground guys on US missions, the Lockheeds, the Boeings, the SSLs? And one way is the acquisition time. And just say, thou shalt do things this way. But usually we give it, we let them uh, float those requirements. Standards are, are, you have to have a common thing to work for, right? You have to have this sort of interface control document, the standard. Um, how fast do they change, right? So I was joking around yesterday, USB 1, I'm like, oh my god, that's USB 3. Um, you know, it, it moves fast. Um, again, I'll pick up the iPhone. They change the connector on me, right? So now I have to buy all new cables for this. Well, why did they do that? Is it a marketing thing to force me to buy that $30 cable? Yes, they're making money off of that. They're making millions off of that. Um, but also it allows them to go to a smaller form factor. Um, so there's actually some usefulness into that. I think one of the challenges with the space world is just, there's just not enough going on to really drive the standards. Um, and things take too long, but the time you standardize it, two years later, that thing's already out of date. Um, and that's maybe where as we sort of increase the numbers of launches, increase the numbers of players that are involved, the standards will just naturally happen. We have, we have I believe, uh, two initiatives, one in Europe and one in the United States, to define a reference architecture for the onboard systems. SAWAR in Europe and SUMO in, in the States. This has have started since years. Still, we are discussing the modules of the reference architecture the next step is that the, the uh, spacecraft manufacturers agree to deploy this in the future satellites and standardize the interface between the different components. But uh, it takes to no. So uh, the uh, Air Force has been talking about standardizing how we do satellite operations for a number of years. Uh, back at the 50th Space Wing out at uh, Schriever, they had uh, the idea called single operating environment, um, and then 
Air Force Base Command put out this uh, document called SATOPS Transformation. Uh, and uh, they, they got so far as to uh, perhaps knock down a few walls and you know, move the terminals together and change patches so people kind of sat next to each other, but they were still doing their stovepipe operations. They had a GPS guy doing his thing, and you have a, you know, a Millstar guy doing their thing. So the next step is, uh, is a study that we're, we're kicking off here soon, once I get collaborative funding, um, to, uh, to do the enterprise ground architecture uh, study. And, and that is a very broad, broadly scoped study. Uh, we'll be kicking off sometime this year. That's going to get their arms around uh, developing uh, a set of open system architecture type standard that uh, future uh, Lockheeds, Boeings, and all the other folks that build the, the traditional large spacecraft uh, can kind of look over their shoulder and, and say, okay, I, I get what they're trying to do, and then not necessarily, you know, uh, also offer up a proprietary ground system to go along with that spacecraft. They would plug their spacecraft into this. And, uh, and on, in addition to this enterprise ground architecture study, there are also efforts to take a look at what we have right now uh, with a way to, I believe, uh, Don Sather from Aerospace was talking about this the other day. Uh, they've been working on an effort since 2009 to plug these different stovepipes into sort of a middleware capability to allow the Air Force to have uh, very, very much fewer people on the other end trained to a standard set of uh, SATOPS, TTNC type uh, uh, skills and not have the, the I wouldn't call them a standing army, uh, standing Air Force perhaps, um, but uh, out of tree room. But uh, the intent is to shrink down the size of these, uh, of these uh, organizations that are doing this job. So, so yeah, so there's an, a new effort going on. Um, and, uh, I, it, so often the government gets this uh, uh, bad rap for, okay, we're studying these things to death. Uh, and perhaps, perhaps that's just the nature of how we do it because, you know, a, a year from now there'll be some other guy up here wearing these and he'll be saying about something else. This is Enterprise Ground Architecture 2, you know, because, you know, we, we kind of get into those ruts. All I can say is, you know, we'll see what we can do. This is this is a serious effort that SMC is going to undertake, uh, and I believe it is the uh, the next step into the efforts that we have done uh, before. We'll, we'll see where it goes. Okay, I have a question I brought out from from Goddard from our infrastructure group looking at future comm systems. For your organization and for industry as whole, 20 years from now. How many new large satellites will have launched and how many CubeSats will be up there? At what data rates? Because they need to know that to build the large infrastructure that has a 20-year lead time. How do, we, how do we answer those infrastructure people? And what do we tell them? By a Lego set. By a Lego set. <laughs> and actually, that's one of the concepts they're looking at. Can they? You want to just laugh at the question. But it's a serious question for those looking at investing in the infrastructure. Is how do you project forward when we're right at that curve of going from zero to unlimited? Well, uh, first of all, I would look at technology demonstrations uh, to, to try to get some predictive value. So don't necessarily assume that everything's going to be RF. It probably won't be. Um, and then. <coughs> You know, as far as how many CubeSats, how many large, uh, the question I would ask back to them is, you know, what does it matter? Is it, or is it the, the data rate and the ways that ground systems are used? And I don't know that that's that different between a CubeSat and a large satellite. I mean, one of the advantages of the laser is that uh, you can get much greater bandwidth at a much smaller mass. So maybe, maybe the question, that particular part of the question isn't as relevant. Mm -hmm. You know, what they have done is look for the past 30 years and plotted how many new missions come online every year. So they said that was a baseline. And they just, you know, you can connect the dots and trend it right on out. And we kind of said that's, that's not the way to do it anymore. And again, it comes out of the cost model. We put a $20 million proposal in, $4 million was set aside for, uh, $2 million was set aside for operations, no, no, for ground contacts. All right, so $2 million to do ground contact for to your mission for two spacecraft with an established network that already exists. You can buy your own antennas for that and then use them on a bunch of different missions. So the costing model, again, is just really sort of a challenge. But I wonder if it really is the Lego brick, right? What is the, if, if I talk ground antennas, what is that Lego brick model, right? Is it a 26 meter? No. Is it a one meter? Well, I mean, 
we're doing the numbers. What if we went and harvested all those black dishes behind the sports bars that no one uses again, right? <laughs> and, and connect them up. I mean, Berkeley's done that before they built the right, some of the larger arrays. Uh, the receivers are dirt cheap. For 20 bucks, you can get from zero to like three gigahertz DC. Um, so what's the right Lego brick for doing some of these components and then phase them out and deploy them as you need to? Dan, you know that uh, in Europe, what always we have in, in force is in the build of satellites, the compliance with all our standards. A satellite provider cannot come with their own design. Should be compliant with, for Europe, the packet utilization standard, that is a service at telecom and telemetry level, should be compliant with the onboard con control procedures, and you command one satellite that is Earth observation or is in the Lagrange point or is deep space or is a constellation or a swarm in the same way. And the telemetry has the same services. So this standardization allows us, you, to be independent of the number of satellites. We develop infrastructure and everybody can use it. And not only that, the other secret is the projects don't get the money. The projects have only money for customization of infrastructure. If you have a lot of money, Every person that has the power will develop his own system because he has the money. And if he says, and he's altruist, and say, I don't need, the, don't need this money. I, I can do with one million dollars instead of 10 or 15. Next time he gets one, he does not get 15. So from his own management, from his own management point of view, he will say, I need 15 million for each mission to cover all his power, his kingdom, and his silo. And uh, this is uh, one of, of the problems. Ground stations, look what is happening in Europe. We have three deep space and 10, 15 meters with some associate. What happens? We say we can close seven or eight, and we go to commercial services. But the ground stations are in the countries that have are part of members of the European Space Agency. So each country says, why you want to close my ground station in my country? Close the other one, and the other is saying the same. Which is the result? The ch we can never close a ground station, and the costs are divided uh, about, uh, over all the customers. These are the problems that the managers are facing uh, continuously. And this is a big problem. But vis-a-vis -vis standardization, if you standardize, you don't depend from the number of missions. Of course, if you have zero, you cannot justify it. But if you have 10 or 20, and you, your infrastructure can support everything, you normally, you don't care about that. A couple just quick questions on your, on your ground operations. Uh, do you have mission ops that require, or missions that require operations less than 24-7, or having controllers available? And if so, how low do you go? So just kind of we created the concept of family of missions. And we have a common team that operates a family of, we have the family of first observation, we have the family of uh, astronomy missions, and we have the family of deep space. So with a, a common core, you can operate different type of satellites that have contacts in different slots during uh, every day. This creates another problem because these families sometimes don't trust each other and goes in ways that uh, are detriment for the infrastructure point of view, but from the operational point of view, this has been a success how we have diminished the number of persons per spacecraft. Do you know the telecommunication operators? This is a, a metric. The record, I believe, is seven, seven satellites with one operator. And I believe it's with Intelsat. <coughs> then comes the CSAS to Intelsat behind. Ours are not sausage machines, the satellites, are proto scientific prototypes, but we are, I believe, between two and three with the operators. So, yes, we definitely have missions that uh, don't require 24 by 7. So, LADI is an example, which is a, a lunar science mission uh, for launch and for LOI, we had 24 by 7 staffing. Uh, but I would say for nominal operations, the majority is lights out, and it's literally lights out. It's, you know, the, you, if you walk in during one of the lights out passes, all the lights are out. And there's an automation. We use Gymsec 
and we have an alert system so that the spacecraft can say, hey, I need help, something's happened, and it will call people in to deal with that. Um, I'm not as familiar with the operational cadence of Kepler, but it certainly has lights out. Uh, Iris, um, I, I could go on, I think almost every mission that's in the, the MLOC at, at Ames has uh, lights out passes, that's, that's the way we do business. I think if I suggested that any of the missions out at uh, Schroeder Air Force Base could go with less than 24-7, that'd be considered a heretic. Um, <laughs> but um, but it all depends on, on the, on the you know, autonomous capability of the spacecraft. Um, now, I would say it depends on the, uh, the criticality of the mission. So we have uh, spacecraft up there that, that are, are doing the missile warning mission, high, incredibly important strategic level mission. Uh, of course, uh, GPS and so on. So these, but there, but there are ways to automate uh, the routine functions that uh, that we do. I heard as high as perhaps 95% of the tasks that our operators are doing um, on the crew floors are um, you can automate. And so, so that's a really hard question for us to, to do because you know you would you would almost suggest that if you're not doing 24/7 ops, then your mission's not that important. Um, but I can tell you, in the in the new uh, way of doing business if, that we're kind of pioneering here with our Sense CubeSat program, um, we have been doing autonomous operations on that. That's a space weather mission. Perhaps you could argue the space weather mission isn't quite as critical as uh, checking to see if IC ICBMs are going to rain down upon Los Angeles. Um, but uh, but the goal there, once we get through uh, our upfront developmental objectives, is to get down to roughly two hours a day. Maybe maybe one hour a day of operator supports, and that's just really to see if make sure that the data is moving where it's supposed to be going, and that uh, you know state of health, and uh, and then plan what we're going to do for the next day. Uh, so so the answer is that we're really starting to scratch the surface on getting there, um, but it's this, that's going to be a long road. I have another joke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when I was young and was supporting operations, there was a joke. Do you know which is the equipment at most used in the ground segment? The video recorder in the control room to watch movies. <laughs> uh, another similar one. How much are you guys using remote access into your systems? Can people from home or at the beach have any inclination what's going on? The Themis spacecraft of, of NASA's they have a website, and they're just their telemetry page in real time is just continually updating. But how far have you guys gone in remote access? Twenty-four seven. <laughs> Only telemetry. Uh, yeah, for Laddie, I'm sad to say we don't really have remote access. Uh, we we wanted it, and we ran out of time. But it was definitely something that could be done, and and can be done, and it could be done in short order if we had the funds. Not a whole lot right now, although some of the hours we put in, we feel we're at home at work. Um, but um, but that's something I think that, again, depending on the criticality of the mission, I think that's something we can work towards. One thing that I did want to add about that, you know, I said it was funding, but it wasn't strictly funding for Laddie. There was also security issues. And the security issues imply a lot of thought about, you know, how do you open it up securely? How do you make sure that somebody doesn't uh, hack into the system and, and make Laddie, you know, hit the moon or something when, when it shouldn't? So the, the security issues were a, a real driving factor for remote access there. Well, I, I, um, I, I know that most of you use this uh, very modern ways of doing it, but there's also some funny stories about the new weeks old. Uh, when the DICE mission uh, setting up this, uh, starting to use this really old dish out of wallops, and the students, of course, wanted remote access to see what was going on. It wasn't really possible. So what they did, and I've been out there and seeing it, they bought an iPhone, and the iPhone is sitting there on a tripod <coughs> looking at this old dial <laughs> instrument, sending it back to the students so they can monitor. That, that's one kind of remote access. <laughs> yeah, we have actually talked about just setting up webcams. <laughs> doing that. Uh, I, I wanted to clarify because I think maybe, maybe some people are confused about Laddie versus Elcross. So for Elcross, that was the one that was supposed to hit the moon. For, for Laddie, we're, <laughs> we're just barnstorming the moon. We're going down to, uh, I think we're going to go down to five, five to ten, five kilometers. Five kilometers. Yeah, for uh, 
for science. And if you look at a topological map of the moon, you realize that five kilometers in some places is, is hitting the moon. So our joke about Elcross, though, was that failure would be we didn't hit the moon. <laughs> OK, I guess, again, the name of the, the conference is Ground System Architectures. Uh, we've talked some about requirements, where they're headed. As we look at architectures, one of the approaches is enterprises. Are we getting more to federated systems, tying not just your families of satellites, but your, your different organizations across the government or across the DOD? Or you know, we have groups that say at NASA, we have 10 healthy centers, and you know, a lot of them process telemetry. So we have a group that says, well, gee, if everyone processes telemetry, why don't we just name one NASA center that processes telemetry? And then they went down the list and said, wow, everyone with NASA satellites has commanding. Why don't we pick a NASA center that can be in charge of commanding? And they, they took that viewpoint up top at, on a study group that said, since we're all doing really the same thing, why don't we make it all common across NASA? We don't think that quite works that way. But I guess as we move to enterprise, though, there are things we can share and things that can be shared across even folks doing disparate missions with disparate systems. So when we talk enterprise within your organization and the new architectures from multi-satellite up to, to something fuller, how broad do you see that enterprise or multi-sat support extending? Next question. <laughs> I was looking at the mic. It, again, it's a cultural problem in our organization. We have tried the last 15 years to have one archive for Earth observation and for science missions. They are located one in Spain, one in Italy. There is no technical impediment to have a common archive. It's political and cultural. And we cannot do this. And uh, uh, at some point, you get cut. But the high-level management don't even speak anymore about that. It's so, and the other problem is that now integrated applications are coming where you need to mix data from all satellites. Right. But in the, in the past, all the scientific community was collaborating in the virtual observatory with astronomy all over the world, and the Earth Observation community is collaborating in the Open Geospatial uh, Consortium and so on. They have dif different type of archive set up, the functionality is very similar, but to put this together is very, very difficult to federate that. It's very, very difficult. And the same with ground stations, because it's, it's your own assets. Uh, DTN is the, the most uh, critical example. The delay tolerant network, you need nodes as internet, but in space. But you need, for that, a space assets owned by agencies not servers owned by the Internet uh, Association. And this is a problem because there are, there are political and cultural problems to access security and so on. So federation is a very nice uh, goal, but to achieve that, uh, breaching cultural and political uh, barriers is very, very difficult. So from the university perspective, I think it's just it's growing, right? Um, so I've always talked about the federated ground station network from the, 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 uh, the antennas themselves, but even I think the software, I mean the space weather community as a whole, as we start sharing this data and even have spacecraft coordinating with each other is going to be huge. Um, one of the challenges I think with the university side is that the faculty members really need to work in an academic environment where <clears throat> it can be pretty competitive. Um, and so as far as funding and as far as publications go, sometimes you need to protect uh, some of that stuff that would be nationally federated. But once those of us get tenure, um, I see <laughs> uh, I see some of that stuff just opening it up and say, here, have it, because it's better for the community. We've staked our claim, we've shown we can do it. Um, now let's, let's actually really go after the real science. So. I guess to some degree, um, DOD's, DOD's been uh, somewhat federated with the Air Force Satellite Control Network, um, and that, that handles uh, a certain amount of capacity for all our various systems, but of course, there are those individual um, stovepiped um, ground systems, as I've said. But uh, the, the study I mentioned before is going to take a look at uh, um, 
not just not just the, the, the antenna part of it, the Air Force Island Control Network. There's various options to, to uh, improve that, to, um, to take a look at perhaps um, shutting some places down, being more optimal, um, to sharing uh, capacity, actually <coughs> moving capacity to commercial assets. Um, and then, uh, so, so you, you, you tackle the antenna piece through a series of, of those efforts, and then you also tackle what I call the SOC piece, the Space Operations Center piece. So the enterprise ground architecture is going to look at all of that, not just uh, how we manage the, uh, the, the pushing the information out to the antennas, but also how we uh, aggregate the, uh, the different uh, space operations centers, um, um, both at Buckley and, and on a tree at some point. And we keep talking about the word federating and federation, and I can't help but think about Star Trek, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Recurrent so theme. Yeah. It is a yeah. Um, but, but seriously, I mean, science fiction is a great place to go to think about, especially the human aspects. And the human aspects are often messier and harder to solve than the technological aspects. So to get to you know, a federation of clouds or a federation of people or a federation of whatever we're talking about, sometimes it is helpful to go look at a human narrative that someone else has written. And so, I, you know, Star Trek is science fiction, obviously. But if you look at it as science possibility and think about what pieces of that we might be able to start working on today. I know there are, you know, there are a lot of things that just seem completely <coughs> insurmountable, and they're very real. They're, they're not, you know, you can't just say, oh, people should cooperate and be all warm and fuzzy and everything is awesome. Um, because you're talking about people's livelihood and their families, and they're competing for scarce resources. So we need to figure out how, how do we work the human factor in there to get to a place where you can talk about federating maybe our little piece of the world. Okay, we have time for about two more questions. The next one, uh, if my organization is looking for funding, <laughs> when's the next NSF call or the next large uh, Air Force procurement activity that could involve a lot of folks here thinking about the, the new ways to do things? It's easy, May 7th. <laughs> Where do they look? It's a deadline. Uh, on the NSF website, just Google CubeSats. So if you check FedBiz up sometime in early March, you'll see a, uh, an RFP for the commercial provisioning study. That's the uh, moving uh, AFSCN capacity to commercial assets. So that should be out there uh, March 12th-ish or so. Nothing's ever perfect, uh, uh, you know, with the, with the government, but the uh, check that is us. <coughs> and then just to, to wrap up, uh, the role of culture, the, you know, the need for change. We've talked about Mr. Flintstone, <laughs> Lego Land, and going back to 1958 <laughs> on history. What do we do to push, push things through? I think we've heard a lot of ideas. Should there be a... Is there more we can do, a different organizational approach? Or where should we really be, really be pushing to make some of this some of this happen? Early retirement sounded like a, one option. Uh, oldest equipment turned out to be the, the managers. So I think we've learned a lot of ideas while we're up here. But what, what do you have to say about how do we really turn this corner now? At agency level, I believe we need an independent program for this type of satellites with uh, no warranty service and uh, to be built in a short period of time. And we need to have the funds uh, to do that. Today, the European Space Agency is very difficult. Mm -hmm. And I would like to remember as well, because we are saying this a lot of Europe, the politicians have distributed money without limits for bailout of banks but when you need money for technology, you don't get it. One, one kilometer of highway in Germany costs four million, in Greece, seven million, <laughs> and you can launch satellites with this. And we don't get these funds, and it's a political problem as well. Because normally the people in the governments that look for technology don't have the power within the government to get more money. Yeah, so, uh I'll bring in commercialization here. So I, I think that uh, the, the government part is important, NASA, DOD, NSF, um, but also getting to the point where space is its own market. 
And then this gets back to incentives and you know how do you how do you support people that want to make space their livelihood? And uh, government plays a very very important role in pushing innovation forward sometimes and often regulating and, and making sure, and regulation is not a nasty word, um, it's very important to make sure that satellites don't crash into each other is a very you know, obvious example. Um, and standards, it's a very, it has a very important role to play. Um, but yeah, I think CubeSats, getting more launches, getting more things up there, that's gonna start getting us where we need to go. I'd say continued support from senior leadership. Um, we don't get anything done or get anywhere unless we have uh, uh, strong advocates with folks at the, at the top of our food chains. And I know, it, I don't think it was an accident that the CubeSat, the science CubeSat program in the US started at NSF and not at NASA. They seem to have a really hard time and wrapping their arms around this. So sometimes it's just about, as you say, it's, it's a different approach and you need to let it happen. Embrace the different approach. I'm going to second the, the leadership comment as well, too. Um, and when we build spacecraft, we build it for a PI. All right, so we built rocks for a sun, we built it for trees. We built Opal for, Opal for Bob Twiggs and, and Ernie Robinson. Uh, when it comes to the ground station side, there's no clear leadership guiding and directing that we can sort of espouse to, right? Um, you go to NASA, you don't know which NASA you're talking to. Uh, go to the university, you go to DOD, and they're like, you're a university? I mean, there's, there's there's a lot of interoperability, but we, we operate in, in some different worlds. Um, so I would love to see sort of a group, even like GSOC, come through and say, this is the vision, this is what we need to make happen, and then find the right leaders to, to, to uh, embrace it. Any other final comments you guys would like to make? Because we're, we're through the questions and we're through with the time. <laughs> okay, then I want to thank the, the panel members. I think we 